Hi, everyone, and welcome to Policy Opportunities at the Intersection of Community Development and Urban Waters. This is a session that's hosted by the Urban Waters Learning Network Equitable Development and Anti-Displacement Collaborative. I'm Renee Mazurik. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling in from Asheville, North Carolina, the traditional lands of the Cherokee tribe. I work along with Deanna Toledo, who is helping me out with this session today uh, for River Network. River Network co-coordinates the Urban Waters Learning Network with Groundwork USA, and we have team members from that organization on the call today as well. I will give a little bit of information about the Urban Waters Learning Network, just in case you're not familiar with us. Um, we are a peer-to-peer -peer network of urban waters practitioners across the United States. You can see the breakdown of the kinds of um, organizations and agencies that are a part of our network on the screen. Um, and we're supported by EPA's Office of Water. Um, we offer resources, impact stories, trainings, and other opportunities for our network. Um, and so gentrification, sometimes called green gentrification, and the resulting displacement um, because of that kind of development have been concerns that our network has raised for many years. Um, and we started to provide some resources around this topic. And in 2020, um, we convened our equitable development and anti-displacement collaborative. Um, we started with four leaders from the network. And today we have six leaders um, in our collaborative. Um, so we, we work to bring um, what, so in our collaborative, we have formed a circle. And in that circle, we talk about um, equitable development and how it is or is not happening in our communities. Um, and then we work to bring more resources to the Urban Waters Learning Network. Um, and that's what brings us here today. So the, the collaborative, and you can see we've got representatives. These two organizations are from New Jersey, Florida, and Groundwork Jacksonville, Colorado. Um, the Junction Coalition is in Toledo, Ohio and CSED is in New Orleans. Um, as part of our circle, um, we adopted some agreements and practices. And as we invite you into our conversation today, we also ask that you, pra you practice these along with us. And if anybody is interested in learning more about um, gathering in a circle and making agreements this way, you can always reach out to me. I'm happy to speak to you about it. Um, but listening with attention, speaking with intention, practicing the pause or taking the time to um, recognize something that's impactful or something that somebody says that's really important and just maybe taking a breath to take it in and let it sit, um, contributing to the well-being of the group, considering your impact. Impacts are not always the same as intentions. And so just um, these are the ways that we meet, and this is what we're introducing to you today. Um, we invite you to share your videos if you're able, um, and you'll also have opportunities to interact with our group uh, and our speakers. If you wanna come off mute um, and ask a question during our discussion after the speakers, um, we welcome that and encourage it. And you can also share your questions in your chat throughout. We will be monitoring that. Um, I, I also want to um, invite everybody to do a land acknowledgement. You can introduce yourself in the chat, say hello, and recognize um, the traditional lands where you're calling in from. I'd also like to say that a, an acknowledgement like this is merely a first step that keeps salient the history of colonialism and recognizes the, the continued presence and contributions made by indigenous peoples today. So I'm about done. Before I turn it over to our collaborative members who are gonna moderate our um, the, our discussion today. Uh, we wanted to get a little information from you who are here today about what extent your community is experiencing displacement pressures due to gentrification. So Diana is going to go ahead and bring up that poll. Folks should be seeing this poll. <clears throat> Oh, 
All right, we still have a number of folks that have not responded to it. I'll give it a couple more seconds. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go ahead and close it down in three, two, one. All right, thank you everybody for responding. Renee? Yes, yeah, so um, significant number of residents and local businesses, about 50% of us have, have responded that way. 30%, a small number of residents and local business are getting pushed out. 15% um, it's on the horizon, 5% um, is not at all. Um, and so this is why we're here today. 50% of you are already experiencing this in your communities. Okay, so I have the honor. Did, did Maria get a ch chance to join? Not yet, okay. We'll hope that she does. And if not, um, Gloria, I'm happy to do the introductions of our speakers. Um, before I turn it over to Gloria, I want to introduce you to two of our collaborative members who will be moderate, moderating today. Um, so we've got Gloria McNair and Maria De Jesus. Um, Gloria is the community engagement manager or coordinator for Groundwork Jacksonville. And in that position, Gloria engages citizens, especially residents from historically underserved urban neighborhoods, envisioning, advocating for, and shaping groundwork projects, including McCoy's Creek restoration and building the Emerald Trail. Dedication to environmental justice and equitable development guides her work. Maria is the housing justice organizer for Ironbound Community Corporation. Her main role is to provide tenants with rights, services to programs and legal services if needed, using her personal experiences to connect with each community member and give them strength to always fight for their rights. So we're really um, grateful to have them in our group and happy to have them here today. I'm gonna turn it over to Gloria, who is going to orient us with um, why we're here today. What, are, what is it that we're talking about, Gloria? So what is equitable development? Based on your responses, it seems as if you've all probably been exposed to what equitable development should look like, which it may not have taken place. And what's the role of community development policy in advocating for equitable development? I would like to kind of have you drop in the chat uh, what do you think of when you hear equitable development? What does it mean to you? I would just like to hear some responses. And especially also add with that, what do you expect to get out of this session, out of this call today? Do I see any responses popping in? Um, bettering everyone's lives, yes. Uh, development that meets the needs of all members of the community and doesn't cause harm. Good definitions. Uh, mine is often sometimes kind of simple as well, um, having that opportunity for everyone to have that good life, right? Education, health, all of it. Okay, we have a shy group today. So I think I'll share the EPA's kind of definition of, of um, equitable development. An approach for meeting the needs of underserved communities through policies and programs that reduce disparities while fostering places that are healthy and vibrant. And taking that definition um, into consideration, you understand how important it is that we have this um, conversation today with representatives from LISC, LISC's um, policy team um, to be precise, because we each can fight our own little fights in our own communities and have some successes, but until we have policies that address these issues across the board where we all can benefit from them and have the same opportunities for our residents, um, we won't have true success, I feel. Do I have some other responses in here? I don't wanna leave anyone out. Um, from David, development that provides equal opportunity and even preferential opportunity for the existing residents of an area. 
And I understand that as well. I think you've all probably seen the diagram of what equal means and what equality means. You know, equal, each person is given that same little step to stand on. And some people seem to think that that means they have the same opportunities. Equity is when we give each individual what they need in order to be successful. So I, I that, okay, that's Gloria's thinking. <laughs> Any other responses? So what are some of the specific ways that you're already working on this? What have, what have been some of the efforts um, exerted by our, our um, partners in crime here? What have you all been doing? I want to hear. I may learn from it all. It is a shy group, Renee. <laughs> They're like, we didn't come here to talk. It's okay. <laughs> It, this means that we can just move on and give our speakers the opportunity to share their wonderful information and inform us of opportunities that are out there for engaging in um, meaningful policies for the community. Thank you, Gloria. And I will just go ahead and introduce our speakers today. And we're very happy to have you with us today, Mark and Michelle. So Mark Kudlowitz is a LISC Senior Policy Director who advocates for federal policies that support LISC's national priorities, including affordable housing, rural development, community development, finance, financial institutions, and equitable transit-oriented development. Before LISC, Mark worked as the Policy Director of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Office of multifamily housing programs and also worked for over seven years at the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund at the De Department of Treasury. Mark managed affordable housing and community development programs at the District of Columbia's Department of Housing and Community Development and held multiple positions at the Housing Assistant Council, a national rural affordable housing organization. Mark earned his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Florida and MSW from the University of Michigan. We also have Michelle Harati with us, policy officer at LISC. Michelle advocates for federal policies to broaden pathways to opportunity, supporting multiple LISC national programs, including economic development and small business, workforce development and financial capability, creative placemaking, and AmeriCorps. Before joining LIST, she worked with the City of San Diego Economic Development Department as a Community Development Specialist. She was also a Senior Asset Building Coordinator at the International Rescue Committee's Financial Opportunity Center in San Diego and served two terms as an AmeriCorps member. Michelle holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of California, Los Angeles, and an MPP from Georgetown University. Welcome to both of you, and I will turn it over to you now. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. This is Mark Kudlowitz from the uh, from LISC. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to start off, uh, go through our, our slides. We're going to try to save a lot of time for questions. And as you think of questions during uh, Michelle and I's remarks, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll get to them at the end. And uh, uh, thanks again for the invitation to speak with you all today. It's a, it's a true pleasure. Um, we're going to just really briefly talk about LISC uh, and then more importantly, get into some of the programs, federal programs, that have passed really since the onset of COVID um, that broadly, or I think we think fit into this anti-displacement equitable uh, community development framework that uh, we're here to talk about today. Um, and so we'll also talk about the very massive amount of money that we're really hoping and, and advocating for will pass in the Build Back Better Act because there's tons of good resources that I think would be great for the work that all of you all are doing nationally at the uh, local level. So next slide, please. Okay, one more, please. Too many breaks. That's that's me. Uh, so, LISC, we are a national nonprofit affordable housing and community development intermediary. So, it really rolls off the tongue. But uh, what it means is the name implies we work to support local affordable housing and community de development efforts uh, in 38 uh, cities throughout the United States, including in Jacksonville. I know uh, uh, we've got uh, folks from there, from Newark. I think where Ironbound Community Corporation is. Uh, and in a rural list network where we partner with over 100 community-based organizations that uh, work in 45 different states. 
Um, and we do that uh, through different kind of uh, programmatic lanes. We've always been uh, an affordable housing organization providing financing and training and technical assistance uh, to further affordable housing preservation and new construction. Uh, we do a lot of work around uh, schools and early childhood centers for, for low income families. Uh, we help put parks and uh, recreational fields uh, in partnership with funders uh, uh, in low-income communities. Uh, and as you heard, uh, Michelle served at a financial opportunity center, uh, which we ho help to support uh, nationally uh, that integrate uh, both uh, ensuring that folks get public benefit programs, which they're entitled to, and also job training so that they can earn a livable wage uh, and do lots of work as well on financing healthy food retail uh, and community health centers. Next slide. Uh, and so how we do it is we uh, aggregate both uh, public uh, and private dollars uh, and use those resources to further efforts uh, led by our partners uh, in these different local offices and these different communities and different rural, rural areas. Uh, so we're really an aggregator uh, as is common of a lot of what are called community development financial institutions or CDFIs. Um, so we take these resources that we can aggregate from the federal government, from other partners, and for folks familiar with community development, real estate projects, affordable housing or others, they've, they're a bit of a layer cake and take a lot of different subsidy sources. So we try to help with that, try to contribute our own resources and also be able to secure other resources in partnership with uh, local nonprofit organizations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just really quickly a listing of, I think, the current offices that we have throughout the United States. They sometimes change. Uh, we've been trying to expand our presence in the southeast uh, part of the United States because of the higher degrees of relative poverty uh, in those communities. So we've opened some offices recently in uh, Memphis, uh, Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, Louisville. Uh, we also have a couple of affiliated entities that we utilize federal tax credit programs to further our work. Uh, so the National Equity Fund, which is a um, uh, what's called a syndicator of low-income housing tax credits, which is our most important subsidy source for affordable rental housing. The New Markets Tax Credit Program, which is a kind of a shallow subsidy for community development projects, uh, typically used for healthcare centers, food retail, uh, YMCAs. Uh, and then we also have an SBA lending affiliate that we use to support um, primarily uh, businesses owned by uh, people of color or women. Next slide, please. Okay, so Michelle and I work in the federal policy part of LISC. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and so we've been, uh, our charge is to go to bat for federal programs, increase resources and where we see gaps, write new bills uh, to provide resources for uh, this sort of work. I'm um, going to go through this relatively quickly, again, using this more as a reference document to kind of spur discussion, uh, since this will be available after the presentation. So a lot has gone on since COVID-19, both in our personal lives and uh, professionally, and then also in a policy uh, sphere. We have had more money appropriated outside of the annual appropriation cycle since World War II. And that is the scale of spending that is occurring out of the federal government. Uh, and so we're trying to make sure that a lot of it's being used for equitable purposes. The ones we wanted to <clears throat> quickly highlight um, is uh, first the CARES Act um, passed in the spring of 2020. Um, most notably, and folks, uh, you know, this is where there'd be good discussion, uh, it, it, it kicked off uh, providing really unrestricted revenue sharing between the federal government and states and localities, something that's really never occurred in any of our lifetimes. And I don't know if it's ever occurred in the federal government in this way, where they're giving essentially free money, very few guardrails uh, to the states and localities. They can use it for all the purposes we're talking about today, affordable housing, anti-displacement efforts, community development projects, uh, revitalizing distressed communities, uh, but they can also use it just to plug budget holes. Um, and, and, uh, and those are all eligible uses. Um, there's been a second round of that funding that we're gonna go into a little deeper that came out of the American Rescue Plan, but just wanted to start with that this 150 billion through the CARES Act, through what was called the Coronavirus Relief Fund. What's really our kind of our most probably important program that we have right now and generally in this lane is the Community Development Block Grant Program uh, or the CDBG program. That's a program that goes by formula from HUD to states and counties and cities. And they can use it broadly for community development projects. Um, really anything under the sun pr pretty much fits. Uh, they can also use up to 15% of those dollars uh, for pr public service activities. So for like traditional social services, uh, but very flexible and, and designed to meet the needs of what the county or city wants. So if you haven't talked 
to your friendly housing and community development staff at your county or city. Um, CDBG is a great resource to try to influence, and we can talk more about that if that's something of interest. Congress did provide an additional $5 billion in the CARES Act uh, for, for, through the CDBG uh, formula uh, with some tweaks where they allowed it to go to some different communities as well based on COVID rates. Um, but CDBG is one that let's put a kind of a pin in, but is a current program that's very oversubscribed and very underfunded, uh, but is very flexible. Um, and there is opportunities to influence how those monies are allocated. Um, the CRF deadline of those, uh, those flexible state local government funds, uh, those were extended uh, to the end of the year. They were gonna expire. And then really quickly, so outside of that $150 billion in the American Rescue Plan in this uh, March of this year, in the spring, uh, put $350 billion on top of the $150 billion in unrestricted money. Difference being that uh, the Biden administration was now in charge versus when the CARES Act was the Trump administration. A lot of emphasis in, in, on, from the Treasury Department who oversees these dollars to use it for equitable purposes, but ultimately they can only nudge. There's no real sticks or carrots that they have. Uh, that's incumbent on local actors really advocating to their legislative bodies at a county or city council uh, to see if they could some of those monies could be used for the purposes that um, you all are interested in. Next slide. Really quickly, again, I'm going to start moving a little quicker because I don't want to take too much time. I want Michelle to have time, then we're going to come back to a few more. Uh, the American Rescue Plan as well um, had the most amount of money in the space that I occupy, really focusing on federal affordable housing. There was $5 billion that went out through a, a, another block grant program at HUD called the Home Investment Partnership Program. But really what's interesting about it is that it allowed uh, new uses. So you can use this, it's primarily focused on uh, people experiencing homelessness at risk of uh, domestic or experienced domestic violence or at risk of it or at risk of homelessness, very uh, vulnerable population types. Um, so states and, uh, and cities receive these resources by formula and they, uh, they can be used for lots of supportive services um, uh, uh, for those targeted populations. Uh, but they can also be used for development projects like permanent supportive housing and other projects that provide housing stability some of, uh, to some of our most vulnerable residents with really the thought being that they're being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 because if you're unsheltered, you're obviously at a much higher risk uh, of, of catching COVID. Um, so that money actually is just now, they wrote a notice, uh, it's, hit this, it's gonna be hitting the streets through competitive notices that the cities and the states will be putting out. Uh, so that's one to think about. We've also had emergency rental assistance, and I'm sure folks have seen the public media on this. It's been a bit of a hardship getting the money out because uh, we've had no experience as, as, a, as a nation in distributing this much in rental assistance. In a normal year, and to put it in perspective, we do around $350 million in emergency rental assistance from the federal government outside of CDBG, which can be used for it. They put around um, uh, uh, $46 billion through pipes that maybe handled 500 to 600 million, showing the you know, immediate need. Those dollars are still trickling out. I'm happy to talk more about the ERA program uh, if you'd like, but it's an important source of dollars. Uh, next slide, please. We've also had an additional five billion in housing choice vouchers. This is our main program to provide rental assistance to low-income households. This isn't a very large expansion. It's uh, HUD's largest program, around half its total budget authority. Uh, and this represents around 70,000 new vouchers that are targeted to some of the most high-risk populations that we just talked about uh, under the home program. So people experiencing their at-risk of homelessness, fleeing domestic violence, or generally considered what's called extremely low income by a federal income standard. Uh, so a very good win. Uh, we also have money that's just now as well being approved by the Treasury Department for distressed homeowners. So again, if, as we're thinking about displacement, um, you know, a lot of low-income homeowners often get kicked out of their house for very small amounts of money that they owe in local property taxes. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a very tragic event because they lose their largest source of wealth. They can't pass that down to their heirs. They can't use that for their own goals and their own lives. And our, and our discrepancy rates and in, uh, in, in racial home ownership rates are as great as they've ever been. They're actually greater than when uh, housing segregation and discrimination was outlawed in 1968 at this point. So we need to keep people in their homes um, uh, to the extent we can broadly. Uh, that's what this money is targeted for. This goes through state housing finance agencies. Um, the first three plans have now been approved by the Treasury Department, who also administers these funds. They can be broadly be used to help people who are in mortgage forbearance, right, who are kind of suspended their mortgage payments with their 
loan servicer. Uh, and these monies are designed to make them whole, to reamortize their mortgage, uh, and to be able to have housing stability and protect their, protect their home. There's also been two tranches of low-income home energy assistance program money that goes through HHS, uh, which can pay utility costs. Some of these other programs can pay similar costs, uh, but this is our main uh, source. Very important, especially in cold weather states as, as, as winter uh, uh, comes. Next slide, please. Just really quickly, the 350 billion that we talked about, that second tranche of unrestricted revenue sharing between the government, the federal government and states, counties, uh, cities and rural communities, there's a lot of little buckets. Um, this is the breakdown. Uh, this shows you how the money's gonna flow. The first payment on these went mostly full out in uh, this year. A second payment for most places, there's a little bit of a nuance based on unemployment rates, uh, will be going out in the spring of next year. So if you haven't seen any uh, stuff that you're interested in as in, uh, for, uh, for your organization at your city or your county or your state with these dollars, you have a second bite of the apple come this spring. Um, so there's an opportunity to uh, organize locally uh, and start advocating for those priorities because after that, that's the end of the money. Uh, and it says right here at the end, uh, at the bottom of the slide, it shows the dates by which the money also has to be incurred and obligated. Th again, this is an amazing opportunity, but, a, but a, a one that is incumbent on local actors working together to try to influence around what they're trying to achieve with uh, anti-displacement or equitable development. Next slide. This is a little more on the uh, on the, on these dollars. There's these broad buckets. You could drive a bus through any of these. Uh, there's not many federal programs that have been created in, uh, like this before. Uh, the one we've highlighted is that they allow the money to be used to address negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency. Well, that's well, that's a lot, uh, including economic harm to workers, households, small businesses, industry, and the public sector. Uh, next slide, please. And um, oh, if you could just go back one more. Yeah, so you can see here, here's another great example. States, localities, rural areas, all these uh, jurisdictions, they can use this broadly for public benefits, for assistance for workers and families to help small businesses um, uh, that are in, uh, uh, are in, a, in this tough place right now financially or have been since the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, they can use it for um, all sorts of other economic sectors that have experienced loss as well. Uh, and uh, let's go to the next slide. We'll keep going here. And what they said as well in the Treasury guidance, which is very broad, uh, is they said if it's in what's called a qualified census tract, which is a government jargon for the low income housing tax credit program, which is basically a, a lower income community, green light go from the Treasury Department on using those funds. Because as we know, low income households have been disproportionately in low income places have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you're broadly doing work, and if you look at these bullets, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen the term social determinants of health used in a federal, uh, a federal financial assistance program, um, but that's a very broad term. It's a, and we do a lot of work around it, but you could use it broadly for those efforts if it's in a distressed community. You could use it for affordable housing and neighborhood development, uh, for vouchers, for residential counseling. Um, you could use it to make sure people aren't kicked out of their house while they wait on this homeowner assistance fund money to come. There's, any use in these kind of distressed areas of the United States would generally pass muster. You can use it to uh, educational disparities, which we know are completely based on zip code and class. You could use it to promote healthy childhood environments. So you could use it for early childcare, other programming for, for youth. So there's just a lot of flexibility with these funds. Uh, and I'm gonna take a break and kick it over to Michelle. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thank you all again for inviting us to join you today. I'm going to just talk through um, on keeping with that subject of the CRF resources, um, zeroing, sorry, the fiscal recovery fund, so $350 billion bucket, um, some con considerations for you to keep in mind in terms of advocating for these and things that states and localities might be looking for. Um, so the first off is that with the unprecedented amount of funding that's coming, a number of states and localities are hesitant, um, given some concerns around future audits and wanting to make sure that anything they're putting out the door, it's gonna be audit proof um, and that they won't be subject to recruitment from the federal government. Uh, so they'll be looking for partners that have experience with complying with federal funding requirements and that can demonstrate there's evidence of being a responsible steward of these funds um, or similar funds in the past. Um, and if you can point to, you know, programs that you want to implement that have similar federal guidelines, such as CDBG, and they fall in line with that, 
And that could be a selling point for those localities who are looking to minimize that risk. Um, and then a lot of, um, there's no formal requirement, but almost all of the communities are using some type of community engagement process, or at the very least putting things out through their city council meetings um, and dockets for opportunities for public comment. And so there's an opportunity to really engage and have conversation with those who are charged at the bureaucratic level of administrating it, but also with the local and county and state level officials and building some coalitions to form a consensus on what are the unmet needs and what are the recommended investments of federal resources. And so just some tangible ways that, you know, what this could look like, drafting sign on letters and circulating to partner organizations within the area that you're targeting, submitting public comments at hearings or on written proposals, uh, undertaking social media campaigns and tagging the appropriate departments. Or no, unfortunately, it doesn't look like it. Garbage. Let me okay. see if we can figure out who that might be. Okay. Should I keep going or was that a question? Or no, I think might just come off mute. Okay. Um, yeah, and so just trying to make sure that you're communicating uh, what your asks are to those who are charged with oversight. And then, uh, like Mark was saying, most states and localities are going to be receiving their funding into disbursements. And so there is an opportunity to influence a second disbursement, which is anticipated in May of 2022. Uh, next slide. And then here we just pulled together and some of this, um, you know, maybe second nature for some of you, but just wanted to make sure that we had it here. Um, some key steps and trying to think about how do you actually access some of these funds. The first right would be, and we have all of the links embedded in here, but would be to go on if you don't already know on Treasury's website and figure out how much funding is flowing to your locality. Um, and then review any publicly available information such as the legislative minutes or approved budgets or newspaper articles to figure out how much money has already had decisions made for it and how much money remains unaccounted for. And then thinking through what are the unmet needs and leveraging any available data you can find to really make the case that these are unmet needs and how your trusted partners um, and your organizations that you may work with in coalition will work together to really try to solve these. Um, and then building consensus on that with the organizations, you know, thinking through what are the potential sources of opposition and engaging those sources of opposition to try to get their consensus, or perhaps they can at least agree not to actively oppose you. Um, developing counterpoints and refining proposals in light of any feedback you get, conducting outreach to the relevant stakeholders, and then just kind of trying to keep up the momentum, right? So even if the first time people tell you no, to continue on through sign on efforts or other types of campaigns that can really lead to um, at least some meeting in the middle. Uh, next slide, please. Here we just wanted to flag a few um, examples that we've seen. There's a couple of great trackers that the National League of Cities and the state councils have pulled together that are tracking how are areas using their funding. Um, a number of states and localities have used it for housing preservation or building new units. Um, and a number of them have also used it for economic development, arts and culture type of programs. Uh, next slide. Here just wanted to touch on um, some EDA programs. So the Economic Development Administration, or EDA, is part of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, they also received $3 billion, and that's in addition to the $1.5 billion that they got under the CARES Act. Um, and as Mark said, for context, this is an agency that normally they're getting about $300, $350 million a year. So the scope and scale of the type of work that they're able to undertake has grown dramatically. Um, what they decided to do with that funding is they issued six separate NOFOs to allocate the $3 billion. And they're really trying to target on communities where EDA investments have not historically gone to. Um, they also released new EDA investment priorities. And for the first time, they've actually explicitly listed equity as their as a priority and it's their first priority. And that's something we're really excited to hear about them doing. And there's also a great resource um, from the IEDC the International Economic Development Council that can help you in terms of thinking through, okay, well, how do you actually go about trying to apply for an EDA grant? Next slide. I just wanted to highlight um, four of the programs that came out from EDA that we think kind of tie into some of this work. The first is the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. 
This was a NOFO that came out where they were really looking at what are integrated regional proposals that we can put forth uh, to scale transformational change in underinvested communities. Um, they received, they did close that on October 19th and received over 529 applications. So I think that tells you the scale of the need and the scope um, and also makes the case for why these policies and programs are so important um, and the amount of unmet need that is going on year after year. Uh, the second was they put money into the Economic Adjustment Assistance Program, about $500 million for that one. Build Back Better for context is about a billion of the three billion. Um, and this is, if you've ever interacted with EDA before, this is EDA's kind of bread and butter program where they're looking really to fund um, hard costs related to you know, development of a new workforce development center, broadband infrastructure, or other pieces. Um, and then they also set aside money for indigenous communities. And they, one thing to note there is they really gave some broad flexibilities in the way that this could be used to support indigenous communities. So wanted to flag that in case there's anyone you work with because they have much more ability to use this, really anything under the sun that might be a, a considered equitable development or facilitating that. And then they also issued a good jobs challenge, which um, is exciting because it's the first time EDA is really committing resources, it's about $500 million here, to fund the actual the soft skills and the training development. For a long time, EDA has taken the stance that they'll fund the development of workforce centers, but not actually the provision of services, um, which leads to a gap. So this one is still out um, and it's open until January 26th of 2022. Next slide. Yeah, Michelle, um, I'm wondering if, if you might just pause here for a second, because this is coming so fast. Um, these All of these funds you're talking about, given our audience of primarily nonprofit organizations, can you help clarify our, who is eligible for those funds and what is the best role for the nonprofits? Is it to partner with others to apply or is it to advocate at city and county level to see how those funds might be used locally? It would drive me crazy if I listen yeah. to it. Um, I think there's two points to that. Uh, on the, the funds from Treasury, the recovery funds, so those are the flexible dollars that have flowed out to the states and localities. Um, so the states and localities are the ones who are essentially charged with administering those resources, and it's up to them to decide, okay, how are we going to use these funds? Like Mark mentioned, they can use it to fill holes in their budget um, from revenue decline they might have suffered because of the pandemic. Um, but they can also use it to focus in on some of those examples that we gave that would have be opportunities for the nonprofits. So on the fiscal recovery aid, the play there um, is one to, it could be general advocacy, right? City, when you're thinking about how to use your dollars that you receive from treasury, we wanna make sure that you are putting, you know, a substantial amount into affordable housing Right, and it, you can keep it broad, um, and it can say affordable housing or you know um, workforce training programs, and it could be just like a list of priorities, and that's more of just the advocacy and coalition building, and um, that would be one stage of it. You could also take it um, a step deeper, and if you're a nonprofit, if it makes sense for you or you're engaged in this work, would be you know, to be much more specific and with your ask, and it could be for, you know, essentially petitioning them to fund your work that you're doing. City with this money, you know, you really need to invest in um, this environmental hazard that's been affecting this community's health long before the pandemic and it's in a qualified census track, like Mark said. Um, and we want you to fund this one specific project, right, to fix this issue, or we want you to fund this program uh, to develop uh, like new small business technical assistance. And we are going to be the ones who actually deliver that technical assistance because we have staff who have that skill set. Um, so that's the fiscal recovery funds. And then on EDA, um, EDA, you would apply for the nonprofit play there. Um, you can apply directly to EDA for resources, um, but the caveat there is you have to be working in uh, cooperation with us, some unit of government. But what that actually looks like in most cases is, you know, you will need, if you're going to put a proposal in, you would need a letter of support. Um, so either from the mayor's office or somewhat if it's at the city level and so forth. Um, 
So does that help clarify those two points? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, and next slide. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so transitioning a little bit here, just wanted to flag two things that are more about direct, um, essentially direct to consumer benefits, direct to individual benefits that were also included in these programs that have gone underutilized. Um, and so wanting to just make sure that this is on everyone's radar um, to make, if, you know, if there's groups that you connect with that are working with direct to beneficiary type of programs that you have the ability to make sure that they're flagging and they're aware of these changes that are happening. Um, so you may have heard, and I'm sure you recognize in your own communities, right? The pandemic, it really brought a spotlight to the issue of digital equity and thinking through how the digital divide really uh, affects opportunity and access to it and who gets to work from home and a number of other things tied into that. And so as part of the American Rescue Plan, they passed a temporary solution to this um, part of the challenge being not just accessibility, but also affordability of high-speed broadband. So they passed the emergency broadband benefit, which was a benefit um, that provides up to $50 per month for broadband services, and then also a discount of up to $100 to actually purchase the equipment to be able to use it. And it would be applied monthly to someone's internet service plan. So you know you can still go to Comcast or whoever, get your normal internet, uh, that you would, and it would apply this discount. So essentially to help close that affordability gap, it has been relatively successful in doing that. And so there's been uncertainty in terms of how long will this program last? Um, and that's been one of the challenges in actually getting people to sign up for EBB that a lot of uh, practitioners have noted the temporary nature. Uh, so to try to solve for that, the bill that recently passed infrastructure, it provided for the affordable connectivity program which is a new long-term $14 billion program. Um, and so there's still, it's not a permanent income support as of yet, um, but advocates think that it can last anywhere from five to 10 years, demanding, depending on the demand for it. And what this will do will essentially phase out and replace the emergency broadband benefit program. So if someone was already enrolled in EBB, they'll be transitioned over to this new affordable connectivity program. The key difference is that it reduces the maximum benefit from 50 to $30 per month. Um, but then it also increases the ways that people could be eligible. So it increases the federal threshold to 200% and then adds another income support of WIC as being qualified. Uh, next slide. Here we just have some of the eligibility guidelines for EBB, again, as Mark said, for your future reference um, and ways to enroll. Uh, next slide. Here, I just wanted to flag um, another resource that came out through the American Rescue Plan is additional resources to FEMA. Um, and part of this uh, is for those who, um, if unfortunately someone in their family passed away from COVID, they have the ability to obtain uh, reimbursement for funeral expenses. So you can get assistance for up to $9,000 per funeral and they still have um, a substantial amount of funding available to this. And perhaps, you know, that could be a silver lining that there's not as many deaths from COVID as they anticipated for this. Um, but one of the senses from advocates is that a number of people just don't know that this benefit is out there. And so wanted to make sure that you all were aware of this benefit. You apply, if someone needs to apply, they would apply directly to FEMA and there's no deadline to apply for this. Um, and so the website information is there as well. Next slide. And next slide. And I'll speed up here in terms of timing. Um, right, you may have heard infrastructure finally got signed into law uh, mid-November, and it includes about $1.2 trillion in investments with about $550 billion in new federal spending over the next five years. So it's a little different um, than the other plans, whereas this is going to be much slower in terms of its rollout. Um, with a substantial amount of money and it's really meant uh, to take some time and it's going to flow through some of our more traditional uh, programs like EPA, uh, DOJ, uh, and others who are DOT who are charged with administering these programs. So you can kind of see the breakdown there. And I also just wanted to flag there's about 21 billion dollars 
Uh, so historic investment for environmental remediation through EPA's programs, primarily Superfund cleanup, brownfields, and the pollution prevention program. Uh, next slide. And here um, is kind of just a consolidated resource list with some key links to try to find some more information if you're interested in. Uh, next slide. And I will pass it back to Mark. Okay, in just a few minutes, we'll try to wrap up the presentation so we have time for questions. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the Build Back Better, right, this is the giant social spending uh, package uh, being advanced by the Biden administration. This is a partisan uh, 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 push by the Democrats, and uh, it has passed the House. We're waiting on the Senate. They are working on process stuff since it's going through reconciliation as an end around to the filibuster. This probably res this by far represents the largest opportunity for the work we do and the work that you all do as well. Um, just really quickly, you know, key priorities: universal pre-K, affordable, high-quality childcare, investments in clean energy and combating cl client climate change affordable housing and workforce development and expanding credits, uh, including the child or continuing the uh, child tax credit and expanding the earned income tax credit, which is really our nation's largest anti-poverty program. Um, really quickly, the appropriations for the government right now on an autopilot till February 18th, that may become an issue later, but right now we're okay. Next slide, please. These are the key housing provisions. I'm not gonna spend it, I can't go through these in time. So um, this is $150 billion in federal affordable housing funds. This will be the largest investment in federal affordable housing. Uh, I don't know, since probably the consolidation of the war on poverty programs, it's been that long. Uh, we'd have to go back to the 70s. Uh, so it's, it's, these are huge resources. I wanna focus on the ones most pertinent to your work. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there's still more. One more slide, please. <laughs> These are the programs that, at least in my opinion, I think are the most pertinent if they get across the finish line here by the end of the year or potentially the next year, if we can get the moderates in the Senate to play ball. Another tranche of CDBG money. Again, this is very flexible money. We already talked about it. Uh, the Community Restoration and Revitalization Fund is a neighborhood revitalization fund primarily targeted to distressed communities, but also to higher income communities where people are at risk of displacement. LISC has worked on this bill. Uh, there are flexible monies for anti-displacement activities broadly uh, for, for low income households in gentrifying neighborhoods or in uh, lower income communities that may be at risk. The Housing Investment Fund is an opportunity for nonprofit housing groups and uh, mission-based lenders, CDFIs, uh, to build and preserve existing affordable housing. There's no better way to prevent displacement than to preserve the very scarce affordable housing that we have in this country. There's also additional money for HUD for fair housing enforcement, uh, which has traditionally been an underfunded part of, in my opinion, uh, of, of HUD. Uh, so those are key resources, especially from a displacement angle. Um, there's also a program, as this is a carrot program called Unlocking Possibilities, which would basically reward localities that reform land use and regulatory barriers to affordable housing. What we often see nationally uh, is that land use uh, and other uh, local building regulations either explicitly outlaw multifamily housing as a way to exclude low income families or put uh, minimum parking sizes or lot sizes, which are de facto exclusionary tactics. Uh, this is a program to again, reward them outside of the CDBG program, although kind of based on it. Uh, next slide. Okay, we got, I think 10 minutes, so we can go ahead and answer some questions when uh, you folks are ready. Well, first, um, Mark and Michelle, I'd like to thank you. That was a lot of information. And as you can guess, there's some very good questions coming out of it. And I think it was regarding the American Rescue um, Plan Act. Um, Catherine asks, um, are there examples of communities successfully engaging with their local governments to influence distribution of funds? I can share, you know, with our own network. I know that um, in Philadelphia, they've built essentially a coalition around advocating for some of the funds and how they want to see it, primarily targeting on affordable housing. And they've drilled down to specifics in terms of these are the types of investments we want to see, whether it's um, new support for vouchers or investments in affordable housing fund. And so they've had some success in terms of influencing how the city is considering that. Um, and I can, there's also, you know, the, the trackers that are out there, I don't think they do a very good job of thinking about and tracking the work that went into specific actions. 
Um, but you might be able to back into that a little bit if you're looking at, you know, for instance, the National League of Cities investment sheet and figuring out, okay, they're using it uh, to support universal basic income or workforce development. And how are they going to use that? And who are the groups that actually influence that? It, that's a little bit unclear in terms of what's available at the national level. I don't know, Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I just popped into the chat. It's, it's hard on the data reporting side with the, with the CRF money or the state local fiscal recovery funds because they just got their first tranche less than a year ago. So it's a public reporting issue. But uh, we do have from some of the national associations here. Here's I flipped in a, a link that shows some examples the National Income Housing Coalition is tracking on affordable housing uses. Um, I also popped in earlier, the National Association of Counties is tracking, uh, but a lot of it right now is folks ad hoc trying to find this information. We should have, I think, better public reporting soon. I, I would like to point out that Deanna has been dropping some very valuable links into the chat throughout, so you may want to check some of those out. And... Oh, there, there was another question. I'm sorry, Catherine, I missed your first question. Um, <laughs> given there are so many uses, how are communities deciding how and where to spend these funds? It's, it's completely up to um, essentially, for the most part, usually elected officials. Sometimes there's discretion within the state itself, the governor uh, on that, and it depends on it depends on how the funding, the budget cycle works for that uh, either state, county, city, the rural communities apply to the states. Um, I think, you know, it, it tends, I think this is a generalization, but in poorer communities, the money is being used more to plug budget holes, which makes sense. In more affluent states, in more affluent cities, which is not the majority of the United States, there's probably more of an opportunity to use it for other purposes because tax revenues have not declined as greatly as anticipated. So if, if you're thinking about it from an anti-displacement and gentrifying markets, which again is not the majority of the US, but in those communities, even though there have been job losses for sure, they've not been as great as, as folks thought when they modeled out this money. Um, so there's probably more opportunities uh, in those areas. Someone also asked Gloria, and I just wanna flip in the chat real quick, um, another link, a lot of links um, about the homeowner yes. assistance fund and how to think through targeting those dollars. The Urban Institute, a research organization um, here in DC, uh, has put out a lot of good data um, showing that forbearance and anticipated foreclosure rates are higher in distressed communities, um, and that the states should be, when allocating those dollars, making uh, prioritizing uh, those populations and places. Uh, uh, to make sure that they're using it in a way that furthers racial equity and uh, racial wealth equity concerns. And I think you've answer, answered April's question. Uh, is there a clear directive regarding expenditure of these funds and meeting administration's Justice 40 goals? It, it appears that it's maybe a little up to the states and local counties or in some cases. Oh, so uh, yeah, so that's a good one we should talk about real quick. Um, so the Environmental Justice 40 Initiative, which sounds like y'all know about, right, is from through the White House and OMB. Right now, there are certain covered programs where they want to steer 40% of those resources for environmental justice purposes. It is possible that OMB, which is kind of the gatekeeper above the federal agencies that reports part of the White House, will include other programs under that purview. Right now, we just have the ones that are listed. If you look at um, the EJ40 website. Uh, it does say we will be working with the agencies. So there could be additional programs, Build Back Better, annually appropriated programs that got pushed into that fold uh, so that the agencies when allocating resources are having this set aside for EJ purposes in these traditionally lower income places. That's good news, but potentially good news. <laughs> Deanna, do you see a question that I'm missing that is very relevant? Ooh, I guess I had a question. This is a lot to track and to absorb, especially for folks in our network who are water focused. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what is the best conduit for them to, because I think to the extent that our folks can advocate on housing is going to be in coalition with others. So clearly list local offices are a place to start, but if there's not a local offices, who are, who are usually um, 
what, what's the best way to track all of this stuff? Or do you have to go to the National Council of Cities and the counties association and all of that? Is it really just very disparate? Um, my sense that it is, yeah, it is very disparate. Um, Mark, feel free to chime in. But I would say, you know, if there is alignment with some of the things we discussed today, and you do have a local LISC office in your network, um, we would be happy to facilitate a connection to the ED, the executive director there, um, and to be a part of, you know, any larger coalitions that they might be leading. Um, a number of them do take on that work at the local level. Um, at the national level, you know, there is a lot of different organizations that are playing in the space and that's part of and doing different pieces of the tracking of what's going on. And that's kind of what's you see reflected even here with uh, the different links, right, whether it's urban um, or it's NLC uh, that are doing that work. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is, um, you know, I'll certainly avail myself. You know, if you if you have questions, just contact me or, you know, I will. I'm sure Michelle's good to take questions too. like if there's something specifically you're thinking about in your community, you don't have a list scope office, or even if you do, just shoot us a note and be like, hey, Mark Michelle, what's up with this? I heard about this program. We'd be happy. That's our day job. So just just please uh, ping us when, when you need some help. And I would definitely, you know, you, we mentioned already that I'm from Jacksonville. I really want to give a shout out to our local LISC here because they have been a wonderful partner to Groundwork Jacksonville. So I can vouch for how uh, cooperative and coalition building that organization is. So reach out to your local LISC, definitely. Mm -hmm. are, are there any other questions? Uh, what, what, people are dropping off and I think we're about right at time so i am going to share my screen one more time and um just to, just to let everybody know there are more opportunities for engagement with our collaborative if there's anything that you're specifically interested in learning more about go ahead and feel free to drop that in the chat we have an equitable development mobilized group that is um, specifically for this topic. Um, and we also would love for you to take some time and fill out our evaluation. And I think Deanna will share some of those links in the chat. Um, also want to just shout out River Rally is happening in DC in 2022. Um, so the Urban Waters Learning Network will host an Urban Waters Learning Forum the day before. Um, and we would love to see you there. And just a big thank you to our presenters, to our, our moderators, um, to the Urban Waters team, and to everybody who came today. Um, thank you so much. Be well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you both, Mark and Michelle. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the invite. It was great. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.